Now that we've taken a look at both SN1 and SN2 reactions, uh, we can kind of step back and try to think about uh, the overall big picture. And when we do so, we see that substitution reactions are definitely interconnected. And there's actually a nice little um, figure in your textbook that demonstrates this in, in terms of, you know, how do you predict whether or not uh, a substrate with a leaving group is going to undergo an SN1 or an SN2. And um, so here I have, uh, you know, in, in order tertiary um, substrate versus secondary versus primary versus a methyl substrate with some leaving group. And you see going from right to left, um, as you go from methyl to primary to secondary to tertiary, the efficiency of an SN1 mechanism increases, such that we typically say for um, methyl substrates and primary substrates, really there's no SN1 uh, mechanism that is ever going to occur. Why is that? Because in an SN1 mechanism, you need to form a carbocation. And for methyl and primary substrates, the carbocation is too unstable uh, to form, and therefore it doesn't form. But for secondary and tertiary uh, substrates, this is going to be the, um, you're, you're going to see more predominance. Namely, in the tertiary uh, substrates, you're, this is basically going to be the dominant mechanism, SN1 uh, mechanism for substitution. Now, Conversely, as we go from left to right, we increase SN2 substitution, and therefore the efficiency increases. So you see that um, as you go from a more bulky substrate in a tertiary to a less bulky substrate in a methyl, the SN2 mechanism efficiency increases. And the reason for this is because now uh, the nucleophile um, is unhindered toward the carbon with the leaving group. We go so far as to say for tertiary um, substrates, there is no SN2, but you can get an SN2 um, reaction mechanism for secondary. And primary and methyl, these are the main uh, uh, mechanism, the driving uh, mechanism of these types of reactions. Now, again, taking a look at stepping back and, and thinking about, you know, how do we predict uh, the mechanism of a reaction? We see that for methyl and primary substrates, these are only going to undergo SN2 uh, reactions. Why? Well, when we take a look at a primary um, substrate with a leaving group, uh, we have two possible pathways. Either um, the uh, nucleophile can come in, so I have a nucleophile, so either it's going to come in and attack the carbon as the leaving group comes off in a concerted mechanism, that means at the, happening at the same time, uh, or the leaving group could come off. And we see, we have already seen that if the leaving group comes off first before the nucleophile attacks in an SN1 mechanism where you're going to form a carbocation, if we take a look at the stability of that carbocation, it's a primary carbocation, and we've we talked about how carbocations are stabilized. They're stabilized through R groups. So the less R groups there are, the less stable it's going to be. And therefore, primary carbocations are going to be very unstable. Hence, the activation energy to produce that carbocation is going to be too high. Conversely, if the nucleophile simply attacks the, um, the carbon with the leaving group and simultaneously the leaving group comes off, so that's called a concerted mechanism, in an SN2 pathway, then we see inversion of configuration, right? The nucleophile comes in, the leaving group comes off, the, the, uh, the carbon, uh, the configuration of the carbon gets inverted, and this certainly occurs. This is going to be the main mechanism. Why? Well, because um, the nucleophile can easily displace the leaving group at an unhindered carbon. So the key is how hindered is that carbon? In an SN2 mechanism, if the carbon is not hindered, then the nucleophile can attack 
and the leaving group can come off. And you don't have to form uh, a carbocation. And therefore, the activation energy for that simultaneous process of the nucleophile coming in and the leaving group coming going off is lower in energy than the formation of the carbocation. Now, for tertiary substrates, we see that they only undergo SN1 mechanism. So again, we can envision um, having a, a tertiary substrate with a leaving group, and we can envision our nucleophile coming in. And now, this time, if the nucleophile uh, attacks the, the uh, carbon and the leaving group comes off simultaneously, this would be an SN2 mechanism, and of course we would get that inversion of configuration. But does this happen? No, it doesn't happen. Why? Because those R groups are blocking the pathway of that nucleophile, and therefore it's, a, it's too hindered of a process. In other words, the energy required to overcome those steric hindrance is too high. The activation energy for the nucleophile approaching this particular carbon is too high. It's higher than if the leaving group simply comes off. And therefore, SN2 mechanism doesn't occur here, but an SN1 mechanism does because um, the activation energy for the formation of a tertiary carbocation is less stable than the activation energy for the nucleophile coming in and the leaving group coming off at the same time. Um, why? Because the tertiary carbocation is stabilized by the R groups and therefore it lowers the activation energy uh, to form that particular carbocation. So those are for primary and tertiary substrates, primary and tertiary alkyl halides. What about secondary? Well, secondary substrates we see can undergo both. And sometimes it is difficult to tell which pathway um, it's actually going to undergo. And there are ways that we can determine that. We can look at um, the kinetics of a reaction. Uh, we can look at the um, stereochemistry of a reaction. But the, the cool thing is that for secondary substrates, we can, some, we can control certain conditions to favor one reaction mechanism over the other. And so when you're analyzing um, a, a problem in which you have a secondary substrate with a leaving group and you, you're asked to predict the, um, the uh, mechanism, be it an SN1 or an SN2, you have to look at um, certain factors. And so let's take a look at what factors though those would be. Well, we have an SN1 versus an SN2. In an SN2, what do we need? We need an unhindered substrate. So for, uh, you know, for secondary substrates, obviously you have two R groups coming off of that carbon. Well, what do those two R groups look like? Are they small R groups or are they large bulky R groups? And this is, this is certainly going to uh, affect the, the mechanism of that reaction. For an SN2, you have small substrates. For an SN1, you have hindered bulky substrates coming off of the carbon. Um, likewise, you have to look at the type of nucleophile. We see that for an SN2, if the nucleophile is strong, then you're going to promote that nucleophilic attack um, and the leaving group coming off at the same time. For an SN1, if the nucleophile is weak, well, then it's not going to uh, it's not going to react as as quickly, and you're going to give that carbon time enough for the leaving group to actually come off and form a carbocation. You can also look at the solvent. For an SN2, we saw that polar aprotic solvents stabilize um, SN2. Why? Well, because an aprotic solvent doesn't interact with the nucleophile, and therefore it doesn't suppress nucleophilicity. As if you don't suppress nucleophilicity, you increase the um, strength of the nucleophile, and thereby a strong nucleophile typically undergoes an SN2 mechanism. 
Conversely, in an SN1, you still want a polar solvent. So both of these um, conditions, we require polar solvents, but now a protic solvent, right? Generally speaking, the more uh, polar the solvent, um, the, the more polar solvents are protic, water, alcohols. So these are protic solvents. Um, why, uh, why do you want a polar protic solvent? Well, because uh, polar protic solvents help to stabilize charge. And in an SN1 mechanism, you're developing charge. You're developing a carbocation. And therefore, if we can stabilize the, that carbocation, we decrease the activation energy, right? So these are things that we're going to be looking at. And th these are things that you're going to be looking at in trying to determine uh, whether or not a mechanism is, is SN1 or SN2. Now, we're going to see in, in the next chapter that uh, there actually is another competing pathway that these reactions can undergo. And that pathway is called elimination. Now, we're not going to look at, at this at this time, but in the next chapter, we're going to see that substitution and elimination are competing pathways. So not only do we have to think about uh, what mechanism SN1 versus SN2, but we have to think about the conditions that favor substitution versus elimination. And that's what we have to look forward to in chapter 8.